Before we get into this horrific true story, I cannot stress enough how disturbing and heartbreaking this story is. Everything you are about to see may leave you disgusted and or in a state of disbelief. This is not an attempt to stir up any discomfort or sadness in anyone who may see this. This particular occurrence is just too crazy not to cover in depth. My heart goes out to anyone involved. I cover the story with the utmost respect and accuracy that I've researched from the documents and the actual case. Everything that you are about to witness in this documentary was gathered by actual news and police reports. If you are at all sensitive to the unsettling, I'd recommend you not watch this. This documentary is for historic purposes due to the lack of information on the subject. It is also not an attempt to glorify murder or death. Now with that being said, let's get into the history. Stella Williamson was her name. She was a spinster and she had lived her whole life in Glitzen. A fine lady, the neighbors say, hardworking and kind. She scrubbed the floors of the United Methodist Church, of which she was an officer and made hoagies for the fireman's benefit. After she sickened and the diabetes took her leg, she would sit on the rocking chair of her gray frame house and tease the kids as they went by. She was a sucker for kids, playing with them, cuddling them, cooking them little treats. So it was a shock after Stella Williamson died late this morning when the people going through her efforts found a note to be opened only after her burial, and even more of a shock to see what lay in an attic trunk. There were the bodies of five babies, dead. According to the papers, they were wrapped in about 40 to 50 years. And then there was the mysterious note, which the people would not release at first. It was still pained, still angry even after all those years. She had written it 20 years ago when she had gone to the hospital for an operation. Today I started to bleed. It began. And I want to make things right if anything should happen to me, she wrote. The town of Glitzen is small. It had a population of 2,413 at the last census and is sort of a town where everyone knows everyone else, at least to say hello, as many are related. It's a depressed town financially. Most of the people go to work in Altoona, nine miles east or 36 miles west of Johnstown. It's a town where many people get by only because of social security and pension checks or because their home has been theirs for generations. That was Stella Williamson's case. Born in Glitzen in 1904, she lived in a somewhat dilapidated three-story wooden frame house and as much as anyone can determine, made her living from keeping a boarder. His name was Guy Schrack, and he had boarded in the Williamson household for 35 years, ever since his wife had died. But he was by all accounts not simply a boarder. He was a man who was devoted to Stella Williamson. In the last five years of her life, when she was in her early 70s and had lost her leg because of the diabetes, he pushed her to church in her wheelchair. It was a sight both comical and sad. A tiny frail man pushing a big heavy set woman. He built a special ramp to the house to accommodate her wheelchair, and on fine days he'd go off with her and they would garden on the little bit of property left to Stella by her brother. A gentle and sentimental man, Shrek. During the last week of her life, when Stella was in the hospital, it was enough to make him cry just to ask how she was. When Stella Williamson passed, there were few people at her funeral. Her preacher recalls barely a dozen, and only two small bouquets. Following the funeral, Schrack went through the house to determine whether Stella had left a will and found instead a letter. To be opened after my burial, the envelope said. It spoke of babies, the bodies of babies in the attic. Shrack, too shaken to go see for himself, notified the local funeral director, who in turn notified the police. We went into the house and took possession of the attic and observed the trunk in the corner of the attic, reported State Trooper John Pudliner. We carried it out and opened the lid and observed at least one child. Subsequent examination revealed five. Decomposed, the bones falling away, they were wrapped in newspapers dating from 1923 to 1933. 
four of the infants based on preliminary examinations at the local hospital were at least full term. One was older, possibly up to a year old. The reasons for death were not determined. Experts were called in, including a medical examiner from Philadelphia and a noted anthropologist from Lancaster who had researched the mummified remains of Ramses III centuries after the pharaoh's death. A month went by, and the talk and glitzen increased. The contents of the letter were not revealed. Neither police nor Guy Schrack were talking. The rumors flew that Stella Williamson's mother had been midwife, and that's how the babies were delivered, that the Williamson household was a brothel, that Stella Williamson's mother had been an abortionist. Folks started to analyze Stella's character as they never had in her lifetime. Some recalled that she was a bit reclusive, never inviting people into her house except for Shrack's relatives. It's hard to go solving mysteries in the past, hard when the clues are 50 or 70 years old and people remember things so differently and so many who might remember are gone. What is a memory anyway but a wisp of a thing? And who can ever say whether the wisp are real? Nevertheless, the few remaining in Glitzen who remember the Williamson family say that Stella's father, Alfred, was a railroad man and that her two older brothers were railroad men too. They remember nothing special about Stella's father, a pleasant man, quiet. Stella's mother is another story. Strict, the few neighbors who remember her say, nasty, a go-to-hell-three-times-a-day Catholic, they say. Though that wasn't her religion, just to turn a phrase. One of those work six-day-a-week people, and on the seventh day you repent your whole life. She kept a tight rein on Stella, a tall, heavy-set, plain-looking girl and kept her in the house, kept her tied down. She seemed to rule the roost at home as well. She got the deed to the property in her name alone, not her husband's, at that time when it usually worked the other way around. She left the house to Stella as long as she didn't marry. She was the sort who'd keep track of unwed mothers in town, the sort who'd count the months a woman and a man had been married before they had their first baby. One woman said she'd cross the street just to keep shy of her, this shouldn't give the wrong idea about Glitzen when Stella Williamson was a girl. The Glitzen the way it is today, with one shirt factory and the demolition on Main Street and the porches all boarded up to make sunrooms. Glitzen the way the mayor's wife, Ursula Schlosser, describes it back then. People would take walks Sunday evenings, talk to the neighbors. We had a coal mine in then, and the railroad was there. It wasn't any bigger thrill than to go around the horseshoe curve on a railroad train. Sit all back so you could see the locomotive coming around up front. Dances. You bet there were dances. The Oriental. That big ballroom closed down now. And the American Legion Hall. But Stella Williamson, tall, heavy Stella Williamson, whose father worked on the railroad and mother kept count of all the scandals in town. Where was Stella Williamson when all the good times were going on? The Glitzen public school records do not show her graduating. They show her only having completed the 8th grade, a good B student, though a little old at the age of 16. After graduation, the local people say she stayed at home and never had a job. But whether she dated or not, or had a happy social life, there again is a mystery. Leona Leonard, who lives over on Corey Street and grew up with Stella, said that Stella did date. I used to always see her with different boyfriends when I was younger. I always used to wonder about it. Perhaps because, as Leonard said, she was never killed with beauty. Then there's Pauline Drass over on Church Street, who said much the same. Stella had gone with her brother for years. Pauline said, Some people thought they might even get married, but they were different religions, and they drifted after Pauline's brother went into the Navy. Yet the mayor of Glitzen, seven years younger than Stella, but friendly with her family, remembers it differently. She didn't go out a whole lot, he said. She was a homebody, ordinary looking, a recluse, even in her younger days, she didn't mix. And there's the question of those babies. Who delivered them? And how did they die? And who even knew they existed? Stella's father died in 1930, after the first of the babies were born. Stella's mother did not die until 1942, well after the birth of the last baby. But what exactly happened in that household? And who is responsible for the baby's death? That's also a mystery.
Science did what it could for the case of Stella Williamson. The state police, county coroner, and a local pathologist held a press conference at the Pennsylvania National Guard Armory. They reported that the first two children to be born to Miss Williamson, those who had been wrapped in newspapers from 1925 to 1927, had died of undetermined causes, and that the three remaining children, one of whom may have been as old as a year, had been rolled homicides. They were precise in speaking of homicides. The death of the third child, aged between three and six months, and wrapped in a newspaper from 1929, was by strangulation. The death of the fourth child, aged nine to 12 months in 1932, was by strangulation and asphyxiation, and the death of the final child in 1933 was by strangulation. They were graphic in their description. Strangulation was performed with a piece of cloth that was wrapped around the baby's neck and used in a noose fashion, and in the case of one death, the end of the cloth had been formed into the tight ball and jammed into the mouth of the baby. There was no speculation about motive. Police acknowledged that a man had been named in Stella Williamson's letter and said that he was alive and living in the area, but was in no way implicated in the deaths and could not be of any assistance. The man's mental condition is deplorable, and he is in a state of bad health and can give us no information, and his wife can give us no information, the coroner said. The pathologist, Dr. Sidney Goldblatt of Johnstown Memorial Hospital, confined most of his remarks to medical tests. He spoke of infanticide only when pressed, saying that it often occurs after a child is a year old, when stress builds up, and adding that it's not even an uncommon crime. In the city of Philadelphia, for example, there were about 25 infanticides a year at the time. What's unusual here is that the infants were kept, he said. What's unusual is that they were stored in a house as a tomb. That, in effect, left the final comments on the case to come from Stella Williamson herself in a letter that the police finally released, the letter she wrote 20 years ago when she thought she was going to die. Out of all the places that I've ever explored, which there have been many different circumstances, many different temperatures, many different atmospheres, I, I've never felt as sick is when I filmed this house. Um, I felt sick. Like, it was just not... I don't... I don't and it wasn't, like... I've, I've gone to places where terrible things have happened and that have terrible histories. But being in this house and picturing, you know, everything that I saw, I thought, you know, well, they hung out in that room. I wonder if those babies walked around in here. I, I wonder, you know, if, if they were born in that bathtub or... You know, you can only imagine the conversations and the and the just the history that went on and the behind these walls and and it you would never think of it if you just walked through here, you know, but you can definitely get a sense of dread. I, I don't know how to even explain it. it. I felt sick for days after doing this. Uh, I di I didn't even like editing it. I didn't like watching the footage, um, and it, it definitely. It definitely made me feel a certain way.
Today, I started to bleed, and I want to make things right if anything should happen to me. In the attic, in an old trunk, you will find babies I had to, blank, 30 years or more. How I got away with, I don't know, but I did so I don't want anyone else to be blamed for something they knew nothing about. This is one reason I could never marry anyone else. I have lived a good life since, so as God is my judge, this is the truth. Please forgive me if you can. Stella. There is one small statement within the letter the police have released. He never wanted me, only something to play with and I was a fool in his hands. You have to kind of sympathize with a person like this. Uh, you know, she wasn't really dealt a good hand, and when she found the opportunity to you know, fall in love and was used and, you know, she probably, it was probably the only time of her life that she felt loved and, uh, it's sad. Very, very, very sad. Do I think Stella Williamson is a monster? No. Do I think she made mistakes and suffered from them her entire life until the day that she died? Yes. Why don't we just leave it at that? Oh man, I mean this merch is like really sick. Check me out, bro.